He's totally against preset questions being asked. It makes the guests feel uncomfortable, and he wants it to be just like they're talking, and that's it. In conversation, it comes up. Sure, you talk about it, but it's just you do it casually. It's things could be more natural, and you probably get more information anyway. There's the ghosts in the trees. I was about six or seven when I had that dream, and uh, I would dream about that often. And it was always outside of my grandma's house, where these big dead cottonwood trees were, and they'd be sitting up there. They would just sit there and they'd watch. It was pretty cool, it scared me, but I wanted to paint that. I worked on the, uh, the stand, the remake of the stand. You did go up there. I did. Nice. Yeah. That was back when Stephen King used to come out with, every summer, yeah. he would come out with like the Tommy Knockers. In the Mouth of Madness, yeah. You know which one I've seen probably the most? Okay, I'll give you two examples. Right. I don't know which I've seen more. There's Terminator 2, which is still one of the best. Like James Cameron, man, he's a, he's brilliant, right? Yeah. And then it was, I think that was a flawless movie. The other one that I believe is flawless, uh, my other favorite director, Michael Mann, Heat, right? Do you like Heat? I'm not even sure if I've ever even watched it. Oh, fuck Heat. I don't know, man. Some things are best left alone. My friends and I would make little shows. It would, it would get so far over the top. It was like a Tarantino movie, and we turned it into this ninja massacre, basically. I brought in my small <laughs> katana sword that I had. I had this Uzi. It was like a Mac 10. <laughs> it looked real, right? Yeah. Well, it was red, but I spray painted it black. I had the katana. My other friend had the Uzi. The other friend, he was a casualty that gets he gets sliced through the gut and he falls into the uh, into the stall under the toilet yeah. as I'm shooting him. And then I had this uh, Millennium Falcon model. I hadn't finished it yet, it was half done, as yeah. most of my models were. I slid that little LED light, I hooked it up to 9 volt battery, and it slid in there and it went into my mom's nose, and then it, you know, her nose would you know, glow <laughs> red, and you could see like yeah. the veins through and everything. See, this is what I need is to collaborate between the two of us. Hopefully we've seen a show where it's like, oh, no, 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 that's been done. I think we should do this. I think we need to do a short. We need to find that person, solid actor, that has those emotions. So it doesn't even look like they're acting. So it, yeah. you just believe that person through the eyes. Sometimes you just gotta be able to unplug from your life and just become a character. I could see a lot of it being artistic license kind of thing. Like, you know, he kind of went his way with it. Keeping that in mind, I think I appreciated it more. Nobody in my family really liked horror films. My mom, she would she would watch something if I was interested in it. Um, I think she kind of liked them in a way. I'm pretty self-conscious about her too. You know what? I I, I'm, I got to get over that. I can't put weight on it. I think she took up six bodies or something like that. She had a small car, so she put one in the passenger seat. So she got pulled over. Fuck, you gotta cover these things up. It's rubber dust, but. Not everybody sees it that way. You get a new guy on the job who just got his fucking badge. He might be a little nervous, right? He sees something like that. That's scary, man. And I remember when I was like six years old looking at this thing and I was always floored by, this was at my grandma's place. And it was really shocking because it was, the art was really good and there was a picture of this, this guy had been executed by a guillotine. And every time I'd go there, I'd flip to that page and be like, oh, it's so graphic, you know, but it was the uh, emotion behind seeing, knowing that these guys executed this guy with the big, heavy knife that falls on this guy's neck and it's now in a basket. It, it was dramatic. Like, it wasn't anything I'd re really seen in a comic. I was way too young when Robocop came out. When they first go into that warehouse though, he gets shot and then they blow his arm off and then it's still a little disturbing. It's the sounds. I think we should do a short. I think we could submit something pretty interesting. I'm really tired of the shit they're putting out. It's like, how the fuck did you guys get, how did you guys get this into production? Well, actually I was on um, The Forsaken and we had some time left over. There's that shitty Keeper's Island Western and we're just sitting around and bullshitting and I was telling about one of my stories. In my script, I wrote, note, just be himself. Do not change character. I would love for you to meet this guy. He could just he could just sit there and just be himself and just let the camera go. They were working on 
Flash, I think it was. So they were actors from Calgary, got me to roll there, do full headline casting with them here, and then they uh, ship them. They had been stuntmen in the Revenant. One guy, he almost died. It's snow everywhere, and there's this big river. So he, he's in the river. He's got a wetsuit underneath his, his costume, his rubber weapons and stuff like that. So they have this fight, and then he's in the river. And he ends up being isolated quite a bit. Like, the production is, is over here. He's down here still, and they've moved on. And there was nobody watching this guy afterwards, but he's actually going into hypothermic shock from being in the river. Tom Hardy saved his life. He came by and saw it, and he stripped him down, and he stripped him down, and they like, did the body he exchange. He, like, he got in there, because he couldn't move anymore. He literally couldn't move, so he would have died, and they wouldn't have known the difference until after it was broken solid. Tom knew he had to get his wetsuit off. You know, they're soaked. Your core temperature is dwindling away so quickly. So yeah, he was like, he literally saved my life on the show. And so that was, they were cool to talk to. The show like at that status was a real asshole. Yeah. <laughs> Tom Hardy also got him in a headlock. Put him in a headlock because he's being a real, yeah. Well, Tom Hardy is a pretty big guy too. Kind of like Justice. You got that from, uh, from the military days? They had all these mannequins that they had from like the 70s. Because that's what they were using before I started making stuff for them. Swap her head, then got some of the other. I wanted to be clinical. My mom, she knew I was into this stuff. and she, At the time, she was in a search and rescue team in Medicine Hat. I did, I did up the makeup. I had to make a body for another exercise that they had, a search and rescue team, and it was a, a hiker that got struck by lightning. And then after that, and I went to Bleeding Art. We've been talking about character simulation, and another director came up, and they had the idea of collaborating with the military, taking a film approach into the exercises, something I hadn't done before. I had actually heard they were using post-it notes when they were doing first aid on each other, and the post-it note would read, bullet hole entry, or bullet hole exit. We molded a bunch of weapons that we had from the Army, made a big arsenal of stunt rubber weapons. It's basically where it started, Wainwright, Alberta, at the military base there. Did that the first year and they liked what we did. They liked the program and been doing it ever since. You know, I know it has a strong impact sometimes. Soldiers have seen it and then they come back. But that's kind of a, a double-edged sword. It's, you know, it's, you're making something that helps them train, but you're also you're triggering horrific past that they've seen and stuff like that. I try not to think about it that negatively impacting as much as the good it could do to uh, have a little bit of a shock factor before they go over and then they can kind of look at it as having done it before and knowing what to do and that's why it needs to look as real as possible you don't want them to laugh at it you can never shy away from the real thing it was almost like that was a part of the test it's like oh you don't want to do film anymore huh? <laughs> Let's put Clive Barker and Stephen King in the mix and see what happens. Yeah, I can tell you about the, uh, the body I made of you, the ambulance that ran over your head. There was the one head, I think this one actually got destroyed because it had been used so many times. So I made these big giant blood bags. I mean, all together, the whole head basically was like a, a big blood container. It was an articulated dummy in there. It was snow packed in the foothills by Bragg Creek. This guy would be laying there and they drove over his head. I almost ran over his head. It was already loaded with the blood. Like yeah. I had it all ready to go, and I shouldn't. Have, I should have had it so I loaded it on set. I'm Stacy Wagner, uh, makeup effects artist. I mostly do sculpture uh, for casualty simulations and a little bit of shows here and there. I spend more time in my shop than I do in my own home. But mostly I made eyes, uh, different parts of makeups and stuff like that. Yeah, I was a mold maker for quite a bit of it. And then on top of that, it was, we were juggling two shows at once. Clyde Barker, um, book, Books of Blood. There was a lot of crazy shit in there. This is just <laughs> fucking ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> we're all fucking sick, eh? It put into perspective that I have to do, I have to juggle film and I have to do this too. Some like to see like dark blood and some like to see brighter stuff and on snow which is really a pain in the ass to try to have it not go orange on the snow. Test it in the water, you know, and see what 
what the base color is if it's yellow, or do you have enough blue in it so that it keeps the blood like a plum color? And if it does, then it'll balance your red out better, and it won't be bright pink, and it won't be orange. Those are your, you can overdo it really easily. These are my standards. It has to look good on the tissue. Obviously, it has to look good on skin. And when you smear it, so it doesn't beat up, and it doesn't separate pigment. It has to work in water so that somebody's in a bathtub. Not too many bubbles, can't get too much soap in there. That was probably one of the best pieces I've made. The blood piece, still to this day. Nice. I would say that that probably still holds up. That was the bloodiest I've ever seen in your set, I think. If you find another house you want to burn, you know what, it doesn't take long to burn.